Hello, everyone, and good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Um, this is Matt Umbro at Hannapin Marketing. We have an exciting webinar for you today. We're going to be talking about new AdWords features you shouldn't ignore. And we're, we're honored to be joined today by Fred Valleys of Optimizer and Jeff Baum, the Director of um, Services here at Hannapin Marketing. Uh, just to give you a little bit of information about Fred and Jeff, as I said, Fred's the founder of Optimizer. Um, he's worked in the PPC space for, for more than a decade, um, and he's a blogger on sites like Search Engine Land and PPC Hero. Uh, Jeff Baum, Director of Services here at Hannapin Marketing. Um, he's a PPC Hero blogger also and also writes for Search Engine Land and really manages um, our big clients here and makes sure everything's in check. And I am Matt Umbro. Um, I'm an associate director of search here at Hannapin Marketing and also a PPC Hero blogger. Um, so Fred, Jeff, great to have you guys here. Thanks for having us back. Great to be here. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Looking forward to this today. Should be a good webinar. I know we've, uh, we've had a few practice runs, so we have a lot of good stuff to share today. So moving forward, um, just to, um, in, in, in terms of the conversation, um, if you are tweeting about this webinar, uh, please include the hashtag ThinkPPC in your tweets, um, or you can also use the webinar question box to send us questions. At the end of the, um, at the end of the webinar, we'll be going over these questions, and we'll also be checking Twitter for questions, so uh, make sure to join the conversation there. And then just to tell you a little bit about Hannapin Marketing, um, we do we run the world's most popular PPC blog, uh, PPC Hero, and that's just ppchero.com. Coincidentally, we celebrated our 10th anniversary on Sunday, so writing about paid search and social for 10 years now. It seems like just yesterday we started. Um, we also run uh, HeroConf, which will be in Los Angeles this year, and I believe this will be the... Um, I believe it's the sixth HeroConf um, we've had in the U.S., so uh, you can find out more there on HeroConf.com. And then Hannapin Marketing in general, uh, in, we're an industry-leading digital marketing agency that manages and optimizes clients' paid search, paid social, and display programs. Um, in fact, our, our first and second clients are still with us today, um, almost 13 years later after we began. Um, even better is that many of our clients will see their accounts grow about 250% faster after signing with us, and about 90% of our partners keep working with us. So all that to say, um, if you need a team of uh, essentially you know, PPC specialists who nerd out on PPC, we have a building uh, full of them. And just to give you a little bit more information about some of our clients, if we go to the next slide, um, you can see some of the clients that we currently work with. Um, so, yeah, if um, at any time you can you can contact us directly, and we'll include contact information at the end. But um, that's a little bit about Hannapin Marketing. So let's move on to the next slide. So I'm going to be speaking first, and what I'm going to be speaking about today are the new ad extensions that can help you optimize results. And these extensions are. Um, mostly have been set up um, this year, but we have a few that were running toward the end of last year that we're going to talk about and, and share some results with. So let's go to the first extension that we want to talk about today. Or I'm sorry, before we do that, we're, we're just going to do a live poll question. Um, so the question is, how long have you been in the PPC industry? Um, less than one year, one to three, three to five, or even five plus? Uh, Jeff and Fred, um, what about you guys? How long have you been in the industry for? So I've been in the industry going on 13 years now, so I've been around pretty much as long as Edwards has been around. And I ran my uh, first PPC ad before Edwards in 1998 from my college dorm room at Stanford. Um, on GoTo.com, I was selling blockbuster videos that I would buy cheap and resell for uh, much more on eBay. A long time. Wow. You, got, you guys have been in it since before it was uh, the, the great industry it is, is today. Um, and so if we look at this, about 
one third of us have been in the industry for five plus years. So we got some good industry veterans here and uh, the rest have been in a little bit less, but that's good because we have new uh, new information to share for both beginners and uh, and advanced. So let's go to the, the first extension we want to talk about today. This one is the price extension on desktop. Now, if many of you remember, uh, about a year ago, Google came out with the price extension just for mobile. In fact, at that time, it was actually called the table extension, but they later changed the name to price. And price extensions were similar to site links in that they show a variety of um, either product categories, specific products where you can deep link to another section of the site. Um, the difference with price extensions, though, is that you can include the price um, with a short description of the product and or category, and you can also share, um, you know, what the price starts at uh, and, and give that range. So for this example here, we have a search for pea seeds, and you, you see in the, in the red box here the three price extensions. We have three of the various um, pea seeds that are available. We give a title, a short description, and it shows the price as well. So along with um, you know, giving more information about the price, it also helps you take up more search real estate. And the big thing too here is it's very similar in, um, in space it takes up to site links where it's very easy to see and, and enticing to click. Now, when we move to the next slide, you can see here how the price extension is set up. Um, you have you put your language and your type in, whether that be product category, services, individual products, and you can choose the currency and the price qualifier. Um, those ones just the, in the previous example showed what the actual price was, but we can do a price qualifier. Uh, so the example here is maybe we're, we're selling tables and they start at um, $1,000. And we can put it units in. Um, we can put obviously we'll put the final URL in and a mobile URL if there is one. But um, it, it's real. Price extensions on desktop are really a great way to showcase a catalog of the products and/or services you have, and really make it easy for users in that card-style format to click to your site. And what have we seen with price extensions? As we move on to the next slide. Um, this is an example from one of our accounts looking at data from the beginning of the year through a couple days ago. And all we've done here is gone to the Add Extensions tab and we've broken out um, the, the click type. So we have, we have phone calls, we have promotions and visual site links, which we'll be talking about in a little bit. But with this particular client, you can see that the price extensions um, aside from the headlines, uh, actually had the second highest number of clicks, even more so than site links. Um, again, they, they stand out a little bit more and they're a little bit more enticing to click. The CTR was pretty good um, and we had a, a decent conversion rate and overall cost per conversion compared to um, some of the other extensions. So the big takeaway is that this price extension, it, it's a, again, it's a little bit more easier to see and it kind of breaks the mold of the, the stringent text and it's more enticing to click. So the next extension we're going to go over is visual site links. And this is currently in beta, but what this is, is it's a mobile only site link that shows images on, or I'm sorry, it's a mobile only extension that shows images um, as your site links. So in this example here, um, you can see the all-inclusive holidays uh, in this ad. They're showing pictures of Caribbean vacations, Hawaii vacations, and you can see what the uh, requirements are. Um, but nothing, nothing too crazy, just um, some images that really describe the product. And again, this is similar to the image extension that Google has since retired, but um, Back around 2013, Google tested an image extension that showed various images of products and or um, categories. And it just makes uh, the, the paid search results a little more visual to compete with those uh, the product listing ads. So um, this, again, mobile only extension, but visual site links are a nice way to, of course, take up more real estate, but um, again, give users more of a reason to click. 
And as we go to the next slide, you can see a couple of examples here. Um, this is for a, uh, a golf resort and spa, and you can see what the visual site links are, whether it's the hotel, the course, uh, the spa. There's a lot of great, um, really, really good images that showcase um, the, this company's uh, offerings and really gives users on mobile devices reason to click. So the next slide, here are some early results we've seen. Again, we're using the same time frame. And we saw some of these early results too on the previous headline, but for one client, visual site links have um, been, been very good when it comes to traffic and conversions. Um, even, though, even though with many of these extensions, the headline still gets the highest amount of traffic and conversions, uh, we see uh, a very good click-through rate when it comes to uh, these visual site links and they show conversion. So I, I think the big thing is is that with these first two extensions we've talked about, they're not just help, helping to take up more real estate, but they're extensions that are really more um, more interactive to, to searchers and give them more of a reason to click. Um, so let's go to the next product in terms of the promotion extension. Again, this one is in beta as well. Um, this, I, I'm dating myself a little bit, but this is similar to a, a, another retired ad extension, the offer extension, where you can put a specific promotion within your ad. Um, it adds that, you can see here in the desktop and the mobile version, you can see that the desktop ad has um, 30 percent off women's boots and it's both on desktop and mobile so it's an extra line of text that gives you the ability to showcase um, an offer that you know maybe it's an offer that is always ongoing but you're not necessarily emphasizing in your copy maybe it's something like you know buy um, buy three and get 10 percent off or something like that but um, it, it does give you that opportunity to add another deal to your to your ad copy. In, in terms of setting that up, um, how that looks, if we go to the next slide, how that looks, <coughs> excuse me, is you have this interactive area here where you can um, put your promotion type in, whether it's a monetary discount or a percentage off. Um, the promo requirement, whether there's a uh, uh, a code or, or whatever and then you can put the item is actually the essentially the text you put in and you have up to 25 characters um, and you can also set the promotional dates that you're that you're able to to run this so um, like all the other extensions you can have uh, the URL options to start or the scheduling um, but it, it, it it's easy to set up and if you do have a promotion that you want to use you can here in terms of those results, what we've seen with the promotion extension um, is, is very good so far. So we have, when we break it out by click type, you can see that we have a fair amount of clicks coming from uh, promotion. It's only second to site links in terms of the actual ad extensions. Um, and the conversion rate is actually better than site links. So uh, it, it is... Um, even though it's a little bit smaller than the price extensions and the um, visual site links, it's still you're still able to see it. And at this point, I'm just going to take a break for a quick question here. Um, someone is, is asking about the the price extensions, and the question is based on the price at this slide. It seems extensions work different in different industries. Um, so I, I think that's fair to say. I mean, ultimately, with everything PPC, you want to make sure you're testing and making sure that um, you know you're you're kind of putting in these practices to ensure that you have the right offer or the right categories of prices. Um, but it, I would say, you know, a lot of these extensions are better for e-commerce, um, just because you know I, I think ultimately. They're really meant to help challenge the PLAs and help text ads be a little bit more, uh, take up more of that real estate. But 
at this point, we don't have a ton of data regarding the um, regarding the, the price extensions. Uh, we've we've we're trying them in a few different verticals, and the slide we showed earlier was from one particular client. We've been running them a lot, so um, data still to come on it. But we did want to share some of the early results we had been seeing. So the last extension we want to cover uh, today is the message extension. And this is something that uh, was released in Q4 of last year, but really didn't get a ton of fanfare. So the message extension is really meant for people who, who like to text a lot. Um, uh, a potential client, or I'm sorry, a searcher can actually click on the ad and send the user, or I'm sorry, send the advertiser a text. In this example here, you see that it says um, you can click to text, got questions, send us a text, and then uh, the the company will send back, uh, or an automated message will show up, and the company can text back. And how that looks on the back end, if you go to the next slide, So with this particular extension, um, what we've set up is uh, an extension where someone can say text us for product info, or we can say text us for product info, and then the actual message text um, that pre-populates is I'd like to know more about the styles of widgets you carry, so please text me. And then of course the company can text back, and you can view this data in Google. Um, we don't have a slide regarding the data just because we, we don't have a ton of clients where it's applicable to, but um, feel free on Twitter to share what you guys have been seeing again with that hashtag ThinkPPC. Um, we'd love to hear kind of what your early thoughts are on the message extension and what you're seeing. And certainly we have a lot of good questions coming in. Um, I'll answer a couple more before we go to um, Fred's section of the of the webinar, and then um, we'll answer the rest during the, the Q and A panel after. Um, but just to <clears throat> excuse me, just to end this portion of the webinar, as we go to the next slide, I did want to wrap up um, what we've kind of the summary of everything here. And really, these extensions are the new kids on the block. Um, and again, visual site links and the promotion extension are in beta, um, so you won't find that um, in your ad extensions tab. In fact, um, even if you do get into the beta, it's in a new tab called um, labs. So that's where those will live. Uh, we do find that these are extensions are seeing better CTRs just because they're a little bit more visual and interactive. Um, they, you know, site links are great, call outs are great, even though those aren't clickable. Uh, but there's just an opportunity to, they stand out that much more and they're available to, uh, they tell a little bit more information that, to consumers. And then the price and promotion extensions are bringing in more conversions, and generally we expected. The promotion makes sense because it is offering a specific deal, but the price, um, kind of like the, that, that's showing more the catalog version of products available. So people that we've seen in the early results are really clinging to that. And then finally, Overall headline CTR really remains strong. With any ad extensions, um, headline CTR tends to be good um, and, and improved, but really with these ones, we've been seeing, we've continued to see um, re really better performance with these um, overall headline CTRs. So I'll, I'll, I'll take just a couple questions before we move on to Fred's section. And a couple questions have been on the um, visual site links and the promotion. So again, these these are in beta. <coughs> excuse me, and they've been written a little bit about, or they've been written about across um, various sites. Um, to get whitelisted, I would recommend reaching out to your Google rep and asking about them. Uh, that's going to be your best bet at this time to get into the betas. Um, and then one a question was if the promo extension is available outside the U.S. And I don't believe, excuse me, I don't believe it is at this point. I would have to double check that, but I believe it's just a um, it's just a U.S. beta at this point. But I'm sure if it isn't already in other countries, it will be coming there soon. When when and if Google. Uh, 
um, makes this a regular ad extension. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Fred to speak to um, some of the uh, some more new features in AdWords. So Fred, take it away. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, definitely some interesting stuff. Those extensions, and uh, you know, Google tells us we can get more than 20% increases in CTR. So definitely some of the easiest and biggest impact things that we can all take advantage of. So my, uh, my topics are going to be a little different. So if you look at the next slide here, um, I'm going to talk about reporting, ad customizers, and scripts. Um, so these are three things that I find particularly interesting. Um, I like to nerd out a little bit on some of the technical stuff. So that's where the ad customizers and the script definitely come into play. But I'll, uh, I'll tell you how you can take advantage of those even if you're not uh, an engineer by, by background. So. If you go to the next slide, you'll see again uh, sort of my agenda for the three topics I want to talk about. Oh, and I missed it too. So we actually do have a poll question. And because I will be talking about reporting, I was just curious, how much time do people right now spend per month on average uh, for each account to do reporting? Right. So if you're an agency and you have 10 accounts, like what's your average time? And if you're just reporting for yourself, then uh, how much are you spending for that one? All right, so we'll give people a, a second to answer here. Uh, now, reporting, the, the reason I'm asking uh, this question is we obviously have some tools in Optimizer that help uh, with automation of optimizations as well as with automating reports. Um, I know agencies like Hannapin Price spend a lot of time on their reports. So uh, let's take a look at what the results here are. All right, so um, it's actually pretty even breakdown. Um, but it's always interesting to see when people spend more than five hours per month um, on reporting tasks. And sort of the, the reason that I find that interesting is as an account manager, as an agency, as an account specialist, you've probably been hired mostly for the optimizations that you do in an account and for making it perform better. Uh, and at some level, I feel like all the time that you have to do just to report your results, that's basically time taken away from uh, the task that you've been hired to do uh, primarily. So let's look at that next slide. Um, and it's going to be my agenda slide. So I'm pretty excited about PPC reporting using if functions in ad customizers to make more relevant ads. Uh, and by the way, that's relevant in the whole context of with the expanded text ads that have recently come out. There's no longer a checkbox to, to specify that one of your ads is mobile preferred. Um, not a ton of people were using that, but for those who were, any reduction of capabilities in AdWords is always kind of a huge pain point. So I'll tell you how you can get back to having that capability uh, using a bit of a workaround with if functions. And then I'll wrap it up with a little bit of talk about PPC automation with AdWords scripts. And specifically, I want to point you to a couple of the new scripts that I've recently written. Um, all of these are freely available, so you can copy and paste them and just put them in your accounts. But let's start on uh, reporting here next. Right. So uh, I've been doing a little bit of blogging on the topic of reporting on search engine land. Um, actually, the last webinar that I did together with Jeff uh, from Hennepin was on how to do awesome reporting for the executive suite. And, and so I wanted to lead with a couple of the most common mistakes that I think people are making when it comes to reporting, right? So you're spending all this time, some people more than five hours per month doing this, and then you, know, you might still not get the results out of it that you were hoping. So what are these common mistakes that hopefully you can avoid? So we'll take a look at the next slide here. So, uh, so number one, and I see this way too often, but reports get sent too soon. Um, so some account managers are just so eager to get that report out on the first day of the next month. So uh, on the 1st of April, they might be sending the report for what happened in March. But my take is that the sooner you send out a report, the, likely, the more likely it is that you're basically not including all the value that you drove for that campaign. And there's a couple of reasons for that. You can see them on the left there. But first of all, AdWords reporting has some delays. Now, it used to be a couple of hours. Generally, AdWords has gotten a lot better. So now, most of the data shows up in the reports within 20 minutes. Um, but, but, but even what we see at Optimizer, when it comes to reporting, like so many people are trying to do scheduled reports on the first of the month, like the first hour of the day. Like it just puts a huge load on the servers. And even though Google has this amazing infrastructure, the same thing happens to them. When I was working at Google, like 
the beginning of the month, it was like this, this horrible time because everybody was trying to do these uh, these massive data pools, and it just put so much load on the servers that other things might fall by the wayside. And so that could include the speed of reporting and having the stats current in your AdWords account. Uh, so that's one reason to hold off at least, I would say, a day before you send out the reports. Now, the reason to hold off potentially two to three days is that Google Analytics is used by some people to track conversion data. And the bigger your account, the longer it takes for GA to push all the data back into AdWords. And so one of the customers I was working with had a relatively decent sized account. And for him, it would take almost four days in some cases before every conversion was finally pushed back into AdWords. Um, so what that meant was literally if I would send reports on the second day of the month to report on what happened the month before it, I might be missing still two days of data, right? Two days of data out of a month of 30 days, that's almost a 10% decrease in the number of conversions that you're going to show. Uh, and in fact, we, we all just went through February, right? I hate it when February is 28 days because it always looks like such a crappy month when it comes to revenue, but it's just because it has three fewer days than your typical month and three out of 30, well, that's 10% right there just based on the number of days. And you kind of get that same effect if you report too soon when you're using Google Analytics. And then uh, if you click the transition here, Matt, but you'll see that the last point is about some conversions take a really long time to happen. So here we have a client who sells a product and he sells to consumers, but he also sells to businesses. Now these business transactions, they tend to take a longer time uh, between when it's for the ad is first clicked and when the, the sale actually happens. But those sales that happen after a longer time also tend to be the higher value ones. So for this particular client, there's like uh, more than 12 days of a path to the conversion. So again, all of this ad spend that you've done in the month of, uh, say, February, well, you might not see that returning into an actual sale until well into the next month. Um, and so just making the point that you, you got to be careful with these things because and I, I've been in the situation where you show the report to the client and every single month it looks like you've done a crappy job. And you're like, no, it's not. We, we haven't done a crappy job. We've actually spent more, but it just, as we know, takes a longer time for those big deals to convert. And if you look at the data, you know, 14 days from now, next month, if you look back at what happened in February or January, the numbers are actually going to look much, much better. They're going to look great. But you just have to give it time. Okay, so that's mistake number one. So if we go to the next one, um, we'll talk about choosing your visuals carefully. So when you do reporting, um, whether it's through a tool like Optimizer or natively through the AdWords tools, but you can make the wrong point in the visualization. So here we have a visual that says, what is your conversion value divided by cost, which is basically return on ad spend for the different device types. And what pops out to me in this is that if you click the transition, tablets with full browsers have like a 25% worse performance than computers. Uh, so if I'm the executive and I, I get presented with this data, or I'm the stakeholder, I'm going to potentially freak out. I'm going to be like, why are you wasting so much money on tablets? But click on the next slide. We've taken the exact same data and we visualized it differently. So now it's a pie chart. Okay, and so now what really stands out is the fact that most of the money, um, the cost, which is at the top of the, this slide, most of the cost is going to computers, and most of the value, which is at the bottom of the slide, also comes back from computers. Um, the second one is mobile devices with full browsers. So this kind of downplays the whole tablet thing. So yes, tablets may be pretty expensive compared to everything else, but in the grand scheme of where we're actually spending money and where we're actually getting sales, it's a small portion. And so the point here is two different visuals from the same data, but they tell different stories, right? So be careful that you're telling the right story. So go next. Um, so the, the third point is average is lie. And Steve uh, was actually, uh, who's on the webinar today, he was asking a question or making a point on Twitter, uh, basically about asking for segmentation. He, he asked Matt, what kind of segmentation did you use when you looked at the stats that you presented to us? Um, and that's exactly the question your stakeholder may ask you as well. So here we have a visual, this comes from Optimizer, and it's basically showing you click on the, the next transition, it's showing why the conversions in an account have changed. And we can see that the impressions have actually dropped by 32%. And then we try to figure out why impressions dropped, right? So we have on the left side, the performance on the search network. On the right-hand side, it's the display network. 
And so um, you're rightfully asking the question, well, a big change in impressions, that could actually just be because we either became active or stopped being active on the display network where we tend to have a lot of volume. So if you click next, a better visualization that would have told a more cohesive story would have been segment this out and take display out of the equation. So now we can see that the conversions are up 5% and that's mostly driven by an increase in clicks and it's actually driven by an increase in impressions. Okay, so just by taking display out of the mix, we show a completely different story. And so typical segments you would look at is brand versus non-brand, performance on different networks, devices, um, if you have a lot of data, look at hour of week, right? Do we do better on Wednesdays at 5 o'clock than Sundays at 10 o'clock in the morning? And also look at audiences. All right, let's take a look at the next one. So uh, the, the sad set that, that we have here, uh, we pull this from Optimizer, but we send a lot of automated reports, and a lot of people don't open them. Um, it, it actually, the, the number recently has been more like 90%. But it's still kind of sad, right? Because so you spend more than five hours a month potentially on sending these reports to people and then they don't actually look at them. Uh, we have a lot of people who say, hey, I would like to have a dashboard. And then you generate a dashboard for your client. And again, they never open it. And, and so what, what I'm sort of, sort of figuring out is the client, whoever's paying the bills, whether it's uh, that they've hired you as an agency or they hired you as an employee, they just want to know that they have a place to go and look at what's being done. And that's often the purpose of a report. And so until, as long as things go great, nobody opens those reports because they don't have any questions. Uh, but they, they do insist that the reports are there um, just for the times when they, they, they do have those questions. So the, the point I'm trying to get at here is how do we generate more useful reports that people actually do want to open and do learn something from, right? So we'll go to the next slide here. And I'll, I'll show you in a few minutes how you could use a tool like Data Studio to actually do a better job at this. So, but uh, reporting is ultimately full of trade-offs. So uh, we can either spend a lot of time manually generating reports, um, but that's time, right? So it's, it's our time and our time is also worth money. Uh, it's also an opportunity cost in terms of the optimizations we can do because we spent time doing reports. Now, on the other hand, if you automate with a tool to save yourself some time, then you have to pay money for that. So um, you have to figure out which is more important and find that right balance. Now, if you go to the next slide, I wanted to show you a couple of the free options uh, that are out there as far as reporting goes. So up until about a month ago, you could use AdWords campaigns, which have scheduled reports, but they're basically data dumps and tables, which are not very easy to read. You have the AdWords reporting tab, which has beautiful visuals, but you can only do one visual at a time. So again, it's kind of a, it, it's a nice way to share one insight, but not really a full on report. And then you have Google Analytics. Google Analytics is cool, but it doesn't really bring in Facebook data or other data and unless you spend a lot of money doing cost imports. Um, plus, they, they have dashboards that are limited to 10 widgets, so it's still not that great. Uh, but then last month, Google said, we're going to take Data Studio, the, uh, the low-end version, and we're going to make it free for everyone to generate as many reports as they want. So up until before then, you could have five reports in a free account, which was too restrictive for a lot of advertisers. But nowadays, that restriction has been lifted, so you can actually use Data Studio to do some pretty amazing reporting. So let me show you um, some of the reporting tasks that I've done. Okay, so number one, we uh, or actually, let me cover the pros and cons first, right? So the pros of Data Studio is that it's highly customizable. You can put on different fonts, colors, and layouts. Uh, the downside of that pro is that it actually takes you a little bit more time to come up with a beautiful style, and, and you almost have to be a bit of a designer to come out with something that's really beautiful, right? So they make it easy to customize everything, but it also means you have to customize everything to make it look awesome. Uh, the other benefit, you can white label it. So if you're an agency, you want to white label it with your logo, your client's logo, totally doable in Data Studio. You can create dashboards that are multiple pages. So there's basically no restriction on how much data you can put in the dashboard. Uh, of course, the downside of that is some people will put in so much data, they'll completely overwhelm the client. But you can put in 
the amount that's right for you. And then another pro is they have data integrations and very deep ones, specifically with Google products. So AdWords, MCC data, analytics, search console, YouTube, big table, big query, all of those things you can connect into. And you can even connect into your own data through MySQL connectors. So you can literally connect right into your company's database and start using that data to do reporting. You can also pull in data from Google Sheets, uh, or you can even do a manual upload of a CSV file that you have or some other structured data. Now, the, uh, the downsides of Data Studio, it is a Google product, so it means they don't really have deep integrations or uh, any integration for that matter with their competitors. So Bing Ads, Facebook, and other Google competitors are not there. So if that's something you're looking for, then you typically have to look at uh, a paid solution like optimizers or some of the other reporting vendors that are out there. Um, you cannot really white label it. So even though you can put logos on, you can't put it on a custom domain. So whenever you uh, the customer goes to the report, they're still going to see it sitting on google.com data studio. Um, it cannot be shared on an automated schedule. So this is more of a dashboard. So it kind of assumes that the user, your client, is going to go look at that dashboard on a periodic basis, but there's not going to be any sort of an email that says, hey, we just started a new month. Go and take a look at the data from last month and how we did for you. And then uh, you can also currently not share it with people who don't have a Gmail or a Google for a work account. So uh, I talked to Google about that. They expect to, to change this restriction. But right now, somebody has to have a Google account because you're sharing the dashboard in just the same way that you would share a Google Doc or a Google spreadsheet. So you have to share it to someone who's got a Google account, not just any random email. Okay, so if, uh, if you think the pros are good enough, and I actually think they're good enough, so there's definitely a place for Data Studio in anybody's tool suite. So let's take a look at some of the things you can do. So um, in Optimizer, we have an MCC dashboard. It's basically a multi-account dashboard. AdWords has a nice multi-account dashboard. And we consistently hear that clients like to share that high-level dashboard um, with some of the executives, right? So it's, it's nice because it's kind of that big picture overview. Now, you don't necessarily want to give someone access to your AdWords account uh, to someone who's not an AdWords expert because if they click on the wrong link or they go and they change something, uh, all of your results could be undone, right? So it's, it's kind of an uncomfortable position to have to give someone access to AdWords where you don't trust that they know what they would be doing in that system. So you can go into Data Studio and you can generate a very nice little dashboardy thing that looks exactly like this with some big numbers at the top and then a full data table below it. So if we go to the next slide, I'll show you how this is generated. So um, you go into Data Studio and you get a canvas just like that. And then if you click the next transition, you'll see at the top, there's a bunch of different visualizations that you can include. So different types of charts, different types of tables, uh, geo heat maps, uh, text, image, etc. And then if you click Next, you'll see that on the right-hand side, that's where you specify what data goes into it. So you specify your data source. And then once you have the data source, you can add dimensions as well as metrics. And so a dimension, every time you add one new dimension, it adds one more line on the table. So basically, it allows you to segment the whole account by device type, by campaign name, et cetera. So it adds more data to the table more rows, and then as far as metrics, those add additional columns. So these are then the data points for each of those specific segments that you've identified. So let me show you how you can connect on to some different data sources. So you go to adding a data source, and then on the left-hand side, you see all the data that you can connect into. These are native integrations, so it's very easy. It shows up just like that. Say that you wanted to go into Google Analytics, Google would say, can, can we have authorization to connect to that account? You basically click yes, and that's it. Now it's connected. It'll then show you a list of your accounts. In this case, I've chosen AdWords, and I can choose between individual AdWords accounts and AdWords manager accounts. If I choose an AdWords manager account, which I've done here, it shows me the list of all of the connected accounts, and now I can select multiple of these. So I can include anything that I want. Uh, the one restriction here is they do have to be on the same currency. So Google doesn't do currency conversion in these reports, so you have to pick accounts with the same currency. But then you can see on the right-hand side, I've selected two accounts, and now these are ready for me to include in any of the visualizations that I want. All right, let's let, take a look at the next slide. So, um, so now you've got that table, right? So now let's spice it up and make it look really visually engaging, something like this one here. So how did I do this? Well, if you click Next, you'll notice that for that conversions column, um, I have, and click next again, for the conversions column, 
I've put in little bar charts. And the way that I've done that, um, and actually click back one, if you can. I guess everything got tied together in the same animation. So, uh, but, uh, but you can still sort of see there for each column in the data set, you get to specify how it's visualized. Is it a bar chart or is it a heat map? I can choose the, the base color for the heat map. With the bar charts, I have an option to say, should we show the number next to it? Um, and each of the columns operates independently. So for something like clicks, I can say, make it really strong green if it's a high number, whereas cost per conversion, uh, a high number is bad, so that should be color coded in red. So it gives me the ultimate flexibility to really make this look exactly the way I want. Let's take a look at the next slide. So uh, then you can also include third party data. So third party data, even though they again don't natively include call tracking vendors or Facebook, you could actually get at that data. What I've done in this example is included a call tracking vendor and how many calls we got from them per day. There's two ways you can go about doing this. Let's look at the first one. So the first one, I've used a tool called Zapier. Um, it is a tool that you have to pay a little bit of money for, but it's cool because they can pull data from one data source and connect it to a different data source. It's a, it's a little bit like if, if this, then that, but more from a business data perspective. And so what we've done here is we've pulled the data from CallRail. Every time a call happens, it automatically gets put onto a Google spreadsheet. And remember, a Google spreadsheet, that is a data source you can use in Data Studio. So if you click next, what we've done now is because we have individual calls listed here, and I actually would prefer to show how many calls happened over the span of any given month, I've built some custom code um, so that I can do time aggregation either by week or by month. And if you click next, you'll see the code behind this. If anyone wants this code, I'm happy to share it with you. Just send me an email at frederick at optimizer.com. But what the code does is it's based on uh, app script. So just like I often talk about AdWords script, Many Google products, like spreadsheets, they have their own version of app script. So I can actually automate some routines, and then you can see that I've made it available as a little drop-down on that sheet, which says Optimizer Options. And, and by clicking on different um, weekly or monthly aggregation, it's actually going to pull from a different function that we've written, and it's going to re-render that spreadsheet. And then if you click Next, you'll see that the final output, in this case, where I wanted to do monthly aggregation, it actually totals up the stats by each month of the year. And now I've got that sheet and that's a great data source. It's very clean. I, I can integrate it into um, Data Studio, but it's also quite nice and easy to integrate in many other reporting tools. So if you want that code again, just email me or, uh, or tweet me about it. So uh, option number two that you have in terms of achieving the same thing is using Data Studio's custom fields. And now what I've done here is you can see at the top of the slide, I've connected to that same data set from Google Sheets but rather than using the process data, I'm going to use the raw data. And then in terms of the raw data, to get an aggregation of how many calls happen on a certain day, I've added a new custom field, and this is what you see at the bottom. So I've called that custom field call count, and I've said it's a formula-based field. And then I can actually write the formula. So Google has pre-built formulas like count, and what I'm counting here is how many items appear on the same date. Okay, so count of date, that gives me the number of calls for any given day. So that's another way to pull the data. And this one is a lot simpler. Um, and so that's another benefit you have through Data Studio. All right, let's take a look at uh, the next thing here that you can do in Data Studio. So as far as these calculated fields, I've just shown you how to do a count, but you can also do other calculations. So if you wanted to include something like how many active ad groups do we have, what's the highest and lowest quality score number in the account, uh, number of keywords with a quality score of six, these are all just simple calculations that we can do. So let's take a look at the next slide. I'll show you first how to do the number of active ad groups. So you just make a new custom calculated field. You call it whatever you want, number of ad groups in this case. And then the formula is just going to be count again. But now we're not counting the number of items for a given day, but we're counting uh, the number of ad groups across, in this case, the whole account. Um, I can also put a secondary filter on it then, which is don't just count the ad groups, but also filter it by a certain status of like active. If you look at the next slide, I'll show you how you can use the min and the max function and actually click one more. So if you go and look at the quality score, you can use a function like min and max. And these are pre-built functions by Google. So there's a whole list that's available to you. But here is how we pull out the max quality score. So let's look at one more. So the, the next one is text-based formulas. So some of you may be running quite complex account structures for your clients or, or for your business. When that 
comes back out into reporting, it often gets really confusing for the, uh, the person looking at the report. So here's an example where we have an alpha beta account structure. And that basically means every single campaign is going to exist in two variations. One of them is going to be called the alpha campaign and the other one is going to be called the beta campaign. On the left hand side, that's the report the, you would typically get out of AdWords. Each campaign has its own data. But basically, the alpha and the beta campaign are selling the same product. It's just different management strategies that you have. So your boss probably doesn't care about that management strategy. They just want to know how much you've sold through the brand campaign. And so how did we total up these two numbers on the left to be one row on the right? If you click next, you'll see there's a text function where you can actually remove or replace words in the sentence. So here I've said replace alpha or beta with nothing. Okay, so just replace it. And so that's how we've totaled up the stats and gotten a report that's much more readable to the stakeholder. All right, let's take a look at the next slide. Oh yeah, not to zoom in so you can skip that one. All right, so, uh, so that's it on reporting. So let me take a couple more minutes here to, uh, to talk uh, more briefly about two other topics I really like. So the first is ad customizers. Um, so you see all the people here, uh, they're all on a mobile device, but imagine some of them were on a, on a computer device. Well, wouldn't it be nice if we could show different ads to them based on what we know about this person and based on the device that they're on? Uh, this is actually possible. So audience targeting obviously is becoming much more important uh, from a bid management perspective because it's pretty easy to manage bids for audiences or to exclude audiences. Um, but what if you could start customizing the ad text based on what you know that those users have done? So how do you go about that? So it's done through business data. You go to the next slide. Um, so business data has been around for a couple of years, so it's not brand new, but uh, there are some new capabilities in it. That's what I'll cover here. But business data at its heart is a way for you to submit a spreadsheet of some data about your business and then use that data automatically, um, dynamically, to generate different ad texts. Okay, so how would you have done um, different ad texts for different device types using this kind of a system? So let's look at the next slide. So uh, historically, what you would have done is you would have had to create a spreadsheet with the different uh, headlines that you wanted to use across different devices. So here now, you literally have to go and create a spreadsheet with every single ad group and every different ad variation, depending on whether it's for a mobile or a non-mobile device. Okay, so that's kind of a lot of data you have to put in, and then you'd have to go into the ad text and put in this kind of uh, data pulling um, object type functionality saying reference my data, which is the spreadsheet, and then pull out the value for headline one. And then the system would automatically know about was this ad being shown to a mobile or a non-mobile device. And based on that, it would vary it up. Okay, so that's kind of the old and relatively clunky, undesirable way to do it. Not a lot of people will do this because it takes too much time. So what's the new thing Google allows you to do now, which is much, much easier. Uh, so the good news is now you can include it as an if function. So if you look at the next slide here, I'll explain to you first what an if function is. So uh, if functions are a very basic concept in programming, um, very easy to understand. It basically says if some condition is true, then do this. And if that condition is not true, then do something else. Okay, so now you have that available through ad text. So let's look at how that looks inside of an ad text. So now when I'm generating the ad text, I'm using the... Um, uh, the syntax that you can see at the top of that slide. So if the device equals mobile, comma, show this. And then the colon indicates this is the default. So the else condition is show the default. Inside of my ad, I've said uh, tools to automate PPC account management. If the user happens to be looking on a mobile device, then we're going to add on the fly to that sentence. Otherwise, we're just going to leave it blank. Do more in less time. Okay, so now I can actually show a different ad to a mobile user uh, very, very easily. Now let's look at the next slide. Here I'm going to show you how to do the same thing based on an audience list that you have. So you say if my audience is in, um, in is then basically saying if it's in any of the following uh, audience lists. So if my audience is in trial signups or Hennepin webinar, then I want to show the ad text fast support. And if it's not inside of one of those audiences, then I just want to show the text get a free trial. Right, so here um, I'm basically it's saying if it's not an existing user on my system who's clicking on my ad, then I want to push the fact that they can get a free trial. If it is an existing user, maybe I want to push some of the benefits of the tool because they already have the trial, they already have the account. So 
So it allows me to show different ads based on what I know about the user. So really powerful, very easy to use. This is available to everyone. So if you haven't looked at it, definitely go and try this out. So that's ad customizers. All right, let's talk about my final topic. And this is one of my favorites. So this is automation and scripting, right? So uh, I was recently watching the movie Hidden Figures. It was nominated for a bunch of Oscars. And it was really interesting to me because they kept talking about computers. Um, but when they talked about computers, it was actually these black women who were doing all the computations for NASA because they were really, really good at math. And so this was before they had a mainframe like the IBM 7090 that you see on the bottom right. But there was a time when all these calculations were done manually and people were called computers. And so it's kind of making the point that uh, you know, uh, things progress. Machines are just much better at doing calculations very quickly. And so how can we take advantage of that same sort of automation um, inside of PPC? And so obviously taking the concepts that we would have done as humans, because as humans we come up with the strategies, we're very good at doing those things. But then actually implementing the strategy and doing the math behind it, that's where a computer probably would be a lot better. So look at the next slide. So that's where AdWords scripts come into play. And AdWords scripts are basically pieces of JavaScript code that you can uh, insert into an AdWords account, and then you can put it on a predefined schedule. So you can do things as often as once per hour. So think of some of the tasks you wish you could do once an hour in an account in AdWords, and then think about how you can code it up through an AdWords script. Okay, so I've said the word coding, so I hope we didn't lose half of the, uh, the audience logging off at this point. Um, so if you look at the next slide, the good news is you don't have to be a programmer to use AdWords scripts. So if you click Next again, if you know how to hit Control C and Control V on your keyboard, then you can do copy and pasting because a lot of people, like myself, have written some of these scripts that you can freely use on your accounts. Okay, so let's take a look at the next slide. Um, so this is a session about what's new in AdWords. So I did want to highlight some of the new capabilities. Specifically, video campaigns are now supported inside of AdWords scripts and audiences are also supported. Um, so some of the things you do around those two, uh, either the campaign type or the targeting type, think of what you could automate through this. One of the things we've automated is checking account budget. So making sure you haven't spent more than the allowed budget for the month across an entire account. Uh, up until recently, we could not make video campaigns part of this whole uh, analysis, but now we can. Now a video campaign gets totaled into everything just as um, a shopping campaign would, a display campaign or a search campaign. So some cool things you can do there. Now there are some things if you look at the next slide that you cannot do with uh, AdWords scripts. And I would love to build scripts around these methodologies. So if you see any of this and you think, yeah, that would be awesome if Fred could go and build us uh, some auction insights automations, tell your Google rep that that is the thing you would love to see next because until they support it in scripts, I just cannot build anything, uh, nor can anyone else, right? So these are the things you cannot do today. So let me uh, wrap up here with two specific examples of some scripts that I've written. Um, so there's one, Stacked Bidding. That one was published on Search Engine Land yesterday. So I'll just go on Search Engine Land or the SEM section and you'll find it as one of the most recent articles. But it's to help you do stacked bidding. Uh, stacked bidding, sometimes also referred to as tiered bidding, is a strategy where you maintain the same keyword in multiple match types and you have different bid levels for them. So you have a higher bid on the more specific match type. So for example, the exact match would have a dollar and then the less specific broad match would always have 60% of the exact match bid, so 60 cents in this case. Um, now this is tricky because you could use a tool like Optimizer, you could use some other tools and you might find that certain keywords perform really well. So maybe you start increasing the bid and then other keywords don't perform well, so you decrease the bid. So as you use these third party tools or even native AdWords tools, things get out of whack with the structure of how you want to maintain your bid, um, your bids vis-a-vis -vis each other. So with this script, it'll actually point out when you're not following the stacked bidding structure that you intend to follow and it'll generate a spreadsheet that suggests the correct bid based on your typical math, and then you can upload that through the bulk upload section of AdWords. So it's kind of a nice uh, thing to run periodically to make sure you're actually implementing your strategies correctly. And then the final script, uh, this is another one that was published on Search Engine Land. Um, so uh, Matt has shown you quite a few nice ad extensions. Uh, 
Google really realizes that the ad text and the extensions have a huge impact on CTR. So what they figured is there's some accounts out there that are not doing enough ad text optimization. So they, they've, they're actually hiring humans now to rewrite high potential ads. So they go into advertisers' accounts. They might be going into your account and writing new ad text on your behalf and putting it into the account because they think you're going to get better performance. Now, if you're on this call, you're probably a bit of a control freak, uh, like most PPC account managers are, and you don't like it when Google does this. So, and especially if you manage multiple accounts, it may be hard for you to stay on top of whether they're doing this. You can't check every account on a daily basis. So I wrote a script that will process all of the accounts under your MCC, and it will look whether any of the ads in that account have the special label that AdWords attaches in case when they manually create a new ad for you. Um, so it's another script that's easy to install, takes, uh, gives you back control over your account. So, uh, so those are some of my recent scripts. If people have ideas or suggestions for new scripts, they'd love to see, love to hear them. Uh, but with that, I will wrap up and yield the, uh, the floor to, to Jeff, who's going to tell us a little bit more about some of the things he finds exciting. Great, thanks, Fred, and thanks for some great, uh, great insights. I uh, could definitely share the pain about reporting. A lot of our clients have uh, very intense reporting, and you know it's always helpful when you can automate any part of that process because you can put together deeper insights uh, quicker and get them out to the client so we can focus more on results. And thank you to Matt for giving us some great insight on ad extensions because the one thing that Google has proven over the last uh, year or so is that ads really matter and they've poured a lot of their technology and, and functionality into new types of features that are going to make ads resonate more. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about some new mobile and GDN features that drive performance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up uh, kind of where Fred left off with if functions, but before we uh, jump fully into if functions, for uh, those that remember what the search results look like back in prior to February of 2016, you might remember that we had uh, a search result full of ads. We had ads at the top of the page, and we had ads at the side of the page. So we were showing roughly eight to ten ads at the time. So it was, uh, you know, that was the standard for about 15 years. And then, as Fred was saying before, we had these uh, mobile-only ads. So what you can do is create an ad and be a standard ad that would have about 25 characters for a headline, uh, two 35-character description lines, and then we would have a static, mo uh, static URL. And then we can check a box, like Fred said, and then we can create a mobile ad. The thing that was difficult about this, it was a lot of ads to manage. So a typical ad group, if you were, you know, A-B testing uh, by device, you would have to have at least four ads per ad group. You would need two mobile ads. You would need two desktop ads uh, that you would be testing at all times. That's a whole lot of ads to have to manage. And I know, speaking from experience, uh, working on some large accounts, because it was so cumbersome, it made it harder to test, and as a result, didn't test as thoroughly as I should have, because just the amount of time it took to set up the test almost, uh, you know, gave away some of the benefit of actually running the test itself. But then what Google did starting in February of 2016, they started clearing the decks a little bit. So in February of last year, uh, the right-hand side ads were removed. So uh, Google surmised after testing over the course of a few years that advertisers weren't seeing much of a, a, a benefit when their ads were pretty much in the fourth to the eighth position, pretty much most of the traffic to ads was going in those top positions. And then, of course, the real reason why Google did this is they also saw that their revenue wasn't dropping off. So what they decided to do is increase the size of the ads. So they increased or they created expanded text ads. So they gave advertisers two headlines uh, and then roughly a 90-character description plus a more uh, – uh, more structured URL. So what we did is, uh, or what they did is they essentially doubled the size of the ad copy, 
they might have given you less space. But then with all the different uh, ad extensions that were coming out that Matt had talked about, it really created a nice unified message that can be uh, presented out there. So if you're a brand, you have a lot more space to convey your message, which is going to you know, create more of an opportunity for you to uh, get clicks, get traffic, and get conversions. So that opened up the space to put a lot of functionality into ads. And one of those is uh, if functions. So an if statement, uh, and I'm not a programmer uh, by any stretch. Fred can probably talk about this uh, all day and night, so he would know a lot more than me. But on a very simple level, an if statement is simply if you meet a specific uh, condition, then something happens. And the perfect if statement is actually a traffic light. So if you meet the condition of of reaching a red light, then you know the action is to stop, for example. If the light is yellow, the, uh, the action is to proceed with caution. And then if you pull up to a green light, then you know the action is to go. So that's an if statement in general. And that's essentially what happens in AdWords with if functions. Uh, we also see if statements in Excel which are complex statements that allow different things to happen, and we see it in all different types of programming and reporting. So the if function really allows for a lot of uh, a lot more specific targeting. So you know strategically, you know being able to target by device and target by audience allows for very specific messaging. Uh, I've always found when I write ads that if you can talk to the user base that you want to reach, so in this example, mobile, if I can say something like, you know, book through your mobile device or, you know, search directly from your phone or call us now, um, that's pretty powerful. And I've seen conversion rates go up. I've seen traffic increase because you're creating that one-to-one -one message. Uh, and same with audience. So if you're setting up a remarketing list, you know, remarketing lists means there's going to be different user behaviors behind it. So depending on your audience, you may want to give a different type of offer because they may be in a different area of the buying cycle. So if you you can create that one-to-one -one connection, that's what we're striving for. And if functions makes that easy. So essentially, in these instances, uh, Google is detecting the device that you're on or the audience that you're trying to reach, and it's allowing you to give the message out at the exact moment in time to the right person. And if functions are pretty easy to write up, so essentially you would just create the curly bracket and write equals if, just like what's on screen, and then you put device equals, and then you would put your, uh, your message out there. And when you do that, uh, you'll get messages just like this. So this is an example that Google uh, has shared in uh, in uh, various instances where you can see what that ad looks like. So you can say the same thing is on a desktop uh, with little nuances. So you know if you want to keep the same 20% off offer, but you want to say I'll give you free shipping if you're you know contacting us from the phone, you can do that. If you just want to have a, a, a different call to action, just maybe a buy now or maybe a, a special offer just uh, particularly for uh, uh, desktop users, then you can do that as well. So there's a lot of flexibility here, and it opens up a ton of A-B testing opportunities, and you're able to do more of those testing opportunities faster as a result of having these if functions in place just along with a lot of other types of bad functionality. So the benefits of AdWords uh, if functions is primarily efficiency. So you don't have to manage as many ads. You can create one ad that's going to be able to handle both uh, desktop and mobile. So you can essentially run two ads instead of four. And then you can mix and match the messages accordingly, and then you can uh, evaluate the data. 
which makes the bar to entry for ad testing that much simpler, which means you'll spend more time thinking about the strategy of what your ads want to look like if, and, and what you're trying to get out of your ads and what you're trying to learn as opposed to dealing with the process of creating a, a lot of ads and then uploading them. As I've mentioned, new A-B testing possibilities, just from having that flexibility, there's that much more that's able to be tested. And the other benefit is they're very similar to ad customizers. So you're getting a lot of the same benefits without the need for a data feed. Now, what I want to stress, they don't replace ad customizers. Ad customizers have their special functionality. And from using ad customizers myself, I've seen uh, great results. So what you want to do is use if functions alongside ad customizers. You want to use all the technologies that are available to you. But if you want to do simple ad customization and you want a low bar to entry, I would suggest that you use if functions because you can get those ads going pretty much right away. They're pretty easy to set up. So right from the AdWords interface, if you just click on the Ad button and you choose Text Ads, you'll get your dialog box where you can write your ad up. And once you add in the curly bracket, you'll see the uh, drop down come up and then you can choose whether you want a countdown ad or keyword insertion or the if function. So what you're doing by selecting the if function, you're telling uh, uh, AdWords that you want an if function type ad. And then uh, uh, you just put in your URL, your tracking templates, and you pretty much have your ad ready to go. And in AdWords Editor, if it's not added already, I assume that in pretty short order, they'll update in Editor the ability to put in their functions as well, and you'll be able to do them at scale. So the good thing is it's very simple to set up, and there's a lot of power behind the functions. So the next area that I'm going to discuss actually is in regard to the Google Display Network. So Google has created something smart, called Smart Display Campaigns. So what Google has done, they've recognized that uh, GDN campaigns could be a little bit cumbersome to manage and optimize, and that's because there's so much data that can flow through a GDN campaign. You can accrue a lot of traffic fast. You can get a lot of data and the network itself is so big that entering machine learning can allow for a deeper crawl of the network and reach areas of the network that would be hard to do manually. So what Google is doing is they're uh, combining the, their automated bidding functionality, their targeting functionality, along with the ability to automatically create ads and optimize. And what Google does to make this all work, uh, what the advertiser does is just needs to provide assets. So you're going to provide an image, you're going to provide a logo, you're going to provide a, a headline, and you're going to submit that to, uh, to the GDN campaigns. And what Google is going to do is take that and they're going to automatically target. They're going to find uh, sites that are most relevant to your product or service. They're also going to be able to uh, uh, automatically optimize. They're going to be able to take the combination of assets that you've given them, and they're going to arrange them in a way that's most likely to convert. So, uh, Google is going to use uh, multiple variations uh, of your ads, and from there, it's going to determine what's the best performing combination and then run with that. So what it does, it takes, uh, it, you know, it takes a lot of, uh, of that manual uh, stress added away and, it, and lowers the bar to entry. The one thing to consider with smart campaigns that's important, if you're in an industry that's highly compliant, or if you're in an industry or an organization where brand guidelines are very strict and you need a lot of control over it, you need to give some thought before using smart display campaigns because you are giving up that control. You want to make sure that your ads are not going to fall out of compliance or out of brand guidelines. So consider that when using smart campaigns. 
So perfect segue into the next section is uh, we are a bunch of control freaks in PPC and we are giving up control. So what we are giving up to use a smart display campaign is we're giving up manual bidding. So we're going to be working off of CPA targets. We're going to be giving up device targeting. We're, we're, we're ceding that control over to the system where Google is going to figure out what works best on uh, which device. And we're also giving up manual ad creation. So we are giving up a whole lot of control. So that's another consideration. If you want fingertip control, then I would suggest that you stay with the standard GDN campaigns. But if you're okay handing over some control and working on the strategy of how you're going to set up your, your campaigns in order to uh, put them in the best environment for success, then smart campaigns are going to be the way to go for you and worth testing. So when your ads are out on the GDN, they're going to show up in something that's called a, a responsive text format or a responsive native format. So if you look at the ads on the right-hand side, you'll see that it's adapting to the uh, to the site that it's on. So giving it the look and feel of the site that it's on versus an ad that's just very standard looking and, and sticks out like a sore thumb in relation to the site design, uh, Google's automatically going to be able to adapt those ads. They're going to adapt to the ad size. They're going to adapt to the look and feel. So you have a better chance of your uh, ads uh, being clicked on and converted because they they look more like content than they do ads. So uh, creating that uh, responsive uh, functionality and then adding it into smart campaigns uh, is uh, the compromise that Google has come up with knowing that advertisers are giving up control. So some best practices for smart campaigns is to consider your structure. So before you launch really any campaign, but particularly a smart campaign, is consider the outcome and build your campaigns in such a way that uh, you can affect that outcome. So for instance, if you have a product or, uh, or your company that offers multiple products, multiple services, you know, for instance, consider uh, separate campaigns. You, you want to not try to mix and match the services because it could confuse uh, the machine learnings and you want to be able to put your ads in front of the right people at the right time. Another important uh, best practice or common practice is to let the system learn. Uh, one thing that many of us, myself included, are guilty of with the GDN is not giving it enough time to optimize or to get enough data to optimize. Uh, you know, all too often we've seen that Google gets a lot of traffic. Uh, it tends not to convert right away. We see that, you know, we spent a lot of money and we haven't gotten the CPA we've desired or the volume that we were expecting. Then we turn it off. Usually that means is we just didn't let it run long enough to get the information we need in order to optimize, and we could be missing out on a huge opportunity. So uh, the best way to move forward is let your campaigns run for at least two weeks and try to accumulate 40 to 50 conversions so the system can learn. And I would compromise uh, with the budget. I would actually put a smaller test budget so your spend doesn't get out of control and you're only spending the money that you're allocating the spend. So that might mean it might take actually a little bit longer for you to uh, accumulate data, but once you accumulate that data and then the system optimizes, then you can scale your campaigns because it's tuned in. So you're, you're giving yourself enough time for the system to learn. You're not spending excessive amounts of money. And while the smart campaigns are doing what it's doing, it allows you to focus on other areas of the account. And then finally, when you make changes, so when you get back your reports and you know which areas of the account are working and you know which ad and asset combinations are the, the best working ones, you'll want to affect incremental changes. Uh, Google, especially the smart campaigns, but Google in general doesn't like large sweeping changes, you know, whether on the search side or whether on the uh, 
the display side, it's always good to move the needle a little bit because especially if you're automating, the system has to learn all over again and that can cause some performance fluctuation. So start small, uh, scale, make an incremental change, scale again, and then just keep iterating over and over again. And then over time, you should see some decent size successes. So smart campaigns are really easy to set up. So when you're setting up a Google Display campaign, you click on your campaign targeting and you choose display. So long as you're choosing a campaign type that's going to affect getting some sort of result, like a, like a conversion or a, a form fill or, you know, something along those lines, you're able to opt into smart campaigns. So all you do is you click the box that allows you to uh, create a smart campaign and then all that functionality will be engaged. And then just like a standard display campaign, you choose your location, you choose your language, and then your bid strategy. So what you can do is you can use a bid portfolio, you enter in your, your target CPA. That's the biggest difference. Uh, when you're entering in a CPA, you know, put in a CPA that's around your goal, but try to, you know, make it a little bit higher so you can give the system room to learn. If you constrict your CPA target too tightly, you may not be able to get enough traffic to test. So, you know, find that balance of, you know, what you can afford in terms of being able to learn while also being able to maintain as much profitability as possible. And then you enter in your budget and then you're pretty much ready to go. So that's the content portion of uh, our presentation today. So we have some offers for you. So I'm going to turn it back over to Fred for a second, and he's going to talk about uh, the optimizer uh, offer that he's uh, giving out for today. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, so we have a number of optimizer users on the call today, uh, but for anyone who hasn't heard about us before, we have software, online software, that help you manage accounts more efficiently. So it includes one-click optimizations, bid management, reporting, uh, lots and lots of time savers for PPC experts like yourself. So if you want to try it out, get a two-week free trial. Um, and I'll kick in another 10% uh, discount if anyone wants to sign up. Just email my team and tell us you were on this call on this webinar today. And uh, we'll refund your first payment, 10% uh, of that. Great. Thanks, Fred. And then in addition to the uh, free trial of Optimizer, uh, we're also offering from the Hannapin side an, a, a free account analysis. So we call that a solutions blueprint. So what we'll do is, you know, provided that your account spend is 15000 a month or more, uh, we'll have some of our experts at Hannapin uh, do a mini audit of your account. We'll look at what's working, where we think that uh, improvements can be made, uh, and what the opportunities are, and then we'll put that into a report, and then we can go ahead and discuss that with you. So lots of value there as well. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, take a minute and decide, uh, you know, what you're interested in and, you know, let us know and we'll be glad to help you. So now it's time for some live QA. So, uh, Matt, do we have any questions that have come in? Yeah, we, we have a bunch of questions. Um, a lot of good, um, a lot of good information discussed and we have a lot of, um, you know, good, some good follow-up questions. Um, so we'll start with, uh, Fred here, um, question for you is, is it not possible to export export the reports via PDF on Google Data Study? Or I, I think the I think Studio. Google Studio. Yeah. A little autocorrect there. Um, so no, in fact, it is not possible today to do a PDF export. You can print individual pages. So if you go into the print menu, then you can say, uh, save it as a PDF. But you can't export the whole thing right now. And it's something they say at Google they're working on. Um, so ultimately, it's really more of a dashboarding solution. And by the way, some of the things I didn't point out, but you can actually put on a date picker. So the person using it doesn't have to stick with the date range that you originally put in. They can change it on the fly. So it's really intended to be used more as a, an online dashboard as opposed to something you would put on a, a schedule 
automatically share as a PDF. That's so the, to the PDF sharing that's probably coming. It doesn't work today. The scheduling of automatically sending it, that is not something Google has talked about. Okay. Um, another one for you, Fred. Uh, I read your article yesterday on Search Engine Land about the stacked bidding. Uh, does this script, uh, will it give the suggestions first in Excel before implementing, or does it implement right away? No, so it uh, definitely does not implement right away. Um, I've written an enhanced version of that script. Um, so at Optimizer, we have what we call enhanced scripts, which removes the need for you to do any coding of any sort. Um, and in that one, you can actually tell us what your ratios are. Um, and then we will automatically populate the correct target bid based off of those ratios. And then if you like it, then you can take the whole thing and push it in through a, a bulk upload in Google. So you still have to do it manually. Um, again, if you're an optimizer client, there are ways that you can uh, combine this, this um, script together with the rule engine. So that basically the rule engine would pick up whatever's in the, the spreadsheet that's generated and it could automate those bids once a day for you. Excellent. Uh, Jeff, question for you. Um, do you have an example of using the if function when advertising uh, for e-commerce that doesn't have a physical store? Hmm. And I think, I think, oh, I was going to say, I think this is, um, I'm wondering if this is more for like if, you know, someone's searching on the go and they're downtown or something and want to go to the store, but there doesn't seem to be a physical location. Hmm. Yeah, I haven't run across that instance yet, but I, I can look into that uh, and see how that would work. Here's what I would do. I would be sneaky. I would use one of these advanced location options. Um, mm. So combine the advanced location option when somebody's at a shopping mall where you know one of your competitors is, like say it's electronics, you know they're at a Best Buy, um, you know, maybe vary up that ad and be like, hey, our prices are usually 10% below Best Buys. Um, it might, might be some trademark issues, there might be other sneakiness issues, but I think that'd be a fun experiment to run. Yeah, no, that would be an interesting experiment. So what we can, yeah, what, what, you, what we can do in that instance is then fuse a couple different uh, pieces of functionality together to create that unique experience. Exactly. Um, Jeff, another one for you. Are GDN smart campaigns in beta, or are they available to everyone? It's saying that it's in beta. I've seen it in my account, so. Uh, Best way to, to find out if it's in uh, someone else's individual account is, you know, go into the interface, click on your campaign targeting, and then choose display only. And then on the right-hand side, uh, well, what will happen is, uh, if I back up a second, all the different types of GDN campaigns will come up. And then I believe on the right-hand side are all the different functionalities for, uh, like, an outcome-based campaign. So getting a conversion. If you click on that, then what you should see is that first screen, like in the screenshot that I, that I had showed in my slide, that says uh, smart campaigns. If that shows up, then you have the functionality in there. Okay. Um, so this one looks to be a question on the price extensions. Um, uh, let's see. Do you have suggestions? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, do you think price extensions make sense if you have one product? Um, so for that one, what I would say is I, I believe you actually need to um, fill out at least three sections or have at least three fields for price extensions to, to go into effect. Um, maybe what I might say is if you have different variations of that one product, maybe if it's kind of like a service model might be you know, you have the deluxe package, you have the max package, and you have the economy package or whatever. Um, you could do that, um, but I believe you have to have at least three fields before you um, can start to run the price extension. Um, let's see, uh, a question here on visual site links. Do you have suggestions on what we could check if visual site links are not working? And by working, I mean approved, but not gaining a single impression. Um, what I've seen with that is, 
for whatever reason, um, maybe sometimes you know it could be kind of, it could be just a setting thing. Maybe for whatever reason, I would double. It, it sounds obvious, but I would double check that you're showing on mobile and just ensure that that's the case. Um, sometimes Google doesn't necessarily disapprove something, but the, it but it's more limited and it really won't show. Um, I guess what I would say if it is approved, but you're, and everything else is constant, you are showing on mobile and it's not working. Um, I would try to re-upload it, or I just try a different um, visual site link altogether. Um, if you guys um, have it, you had any experience with anything like that when using visual site links? I. To be honest with you, I haven't had a lot of my clients uh, use the visual site links, and in some of our accounts, we're just beginning the testing, so uh, we're still compiling all our learnings. Okay. Um, so next question, Jeff, is for you. Um, any issues with the API exchange, or does AdWords recognize the functions during upload? And I think this refers to um, I think it refers to the if functions during the bulk uploads and editor, um, which I, I which I believe we were unsure about. But um, and anything to add to that as I look to get further clarity on that question, Jeff? I'm not aware of any issues. I mean, I know historically, you know, that that uh, it's more susceptible to issues until you know, the next release of editor where, you know, they fully update all the functionality, but I haven't heard of, you know, any troubles yet, but it is early on. So we, I think that's something that we'll just have to monitor and, and see for now uh, and then go from there. But usually Google gets those resolved pretty fast. Okay, excellent. Um, Fred, question for you. Um, how would you suggest someone go about testing Google Data Studio who's been using other reporting platforms and maybe is a little weary of the product? Well, I mean, I would think, ask yourself the question of what is it you're hoping to do better that you can't do with your current reporting solution. Um, and consider it as not just an alternative, but an addition to your existing reporting suite. And so, I mean, from my perspective, I think there's some very interesting things you can do with like the calculated fields. Um, it's it's pretty nice as a dashboarding solution. So I see it more as a thing you might put in your office to keep a, a live eye, a live view of what's happening in the accounts. Um, I don't necessarily see it as a full-fledged replacement for a monthly reporting solution when the client expects to get an email with an attachment of some sort. Um, but, but I think, and the reason I wanted to talk about it today is because I think it does have a place in a PPC manager's tool suite, and especially given the price right now, which is free, it's pretty unbeatable for a pretty, pretty capable tool. So, um, but, 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 but then I also think that even looking at pay tools like Optimizer and other reporting tools, like there just is no perfect solution out there. And, and that's, that's where you have to figure out, I mean, how much can we standardize and use the tools capabilities to achieve something that's good enough, um, because that good enough is your trade-off between time and money, right? So you can go back and do, do things manually, but how much does that cost you in terms of um, opportunity cost that you're not spending time optimizing the account? And at the end of the, the day, I think most clients would care more about having great results rather than having the perfect report. And one thing I also didn't talk about as far as reporting, but the more that you can sort of set the direction on reports and tell your client, this is how we do it because this, uh, you don't tell them about the tools, right? But you're like, this is the report and this is why we believe this is the right information. Get them to be bought into it as opposed to letting them um, tell you what to do because invariably it's going to lead to custom work and it's going to take away from the things that you actually like to spend time on. Okay. Um, Jeff, question for you regarding um, if functions. So now the Basically, in this webinar, we've seen that you, even though you can't write the mobile preferred ads anymore, you can use these if functions, and you can also use ad customizers to show mobile ads. Um, in your opinion, what, how would you recommend users start to test um, 
if function ads or you know the, the ad customizers for mobile in their campaigns is is it something that's more of a you should put these if function ads account wide or or should you test to begin with Sure. So I always prefer to test before I go account wide. I'll usually pick, uh, you know, a campaign or, or new ad groups and work the kinks out before I deploy uh, account wide. So, uh, you know, it's less about the if if functionality. That's pretty easy to set up. It's all about getting your message right. So once you feel like you've got a message that you're getting good response to and you're, you're meeting your metrics, then that's when I would expand it out. So uh, the way that I think about it philosophically is more of how I would think about it if I was rolling in the old mobile ads. You know, I would, you know, test in a few spots, try to tune the message in, then I would deploy it across the account. Excellent. Um, next question. Um, I believe we can. Um, this, I, I think, any you know, anyone who has an opinion here can answer. Um, do you use the countdown function in connection with um, data fields and business data? Uh, and have you had the date fill in successfully? It looks like my experience has shown regular countdown ads show quite often, whereas the same ad that pulls the date or the date from business data shows maybe five to ten percent of the time. So I think, in other words what this person is saying is that when they use the countdown function alone by just manually putting it in the ad, um, it works more than when they put a countdown function within the business data section and update that. Um, so any, any thoughts on that, guys? Yeah, I would definitely prefer using the countdown function if you're trying to achieve the exact same outcome in terms of what the ad is going to look like. The, uh, the countdown function is just much easier to implement. You don't have to go back to your spreadsheet or, or you don't have to set it up a couple of days ahead with all the right values. Um, I think what's happening in your case though is you're probably using it to do slightly different things. So you're not just showing a countdown but different creative based on uh, what the date is. And now you might run into ad serving issues and prioritization issues. So I don't know if you've got your ad rotation set to uh, even distribution. Um, but quality score basically comes into play now, right? So Google uh, may not know exactly what's going to happen with that new ad variation that you're showing, so they may be a bit more cautious. Maybe they do show it a lot, and one day versus the next uh, doesn't perform very well with that new ad text that you're showing, so the quality score goes down, so Google starts to prefer the, uh, the static fallback ad as opposed to the dynamically generated one. So I, I think when all of that comes into play, it's just very hard to predict exactly what's going to happen and which ad's going to show. Yeah, agreed. I mean, and I think just in general, um, whenever you use business data, ad customizers are, I mean, you know me, I, I love ad customizers, but you, you always run that risk of, you know, something either not working or, they're an issue in the back end, so I agree that you know I would rather do the countdown, especially right from the beginning, uh, or I'm sorry, right within the interface, and use the actual countdown function. And if you want to update that, I would just use, um, you know, I would just use a some sort of promo template and upload through editor. So, um, so I guess that would be kind of the the explanation there as why the countdown function would show more than when it would be in with business data. Um, so next question, and, and please keep the questions coming. Um, we we still have some time left, so if uh, you, anyone has any questions, um, just put them in the chat box here, and we'll answer them. Um, so next question for you, Fred, is: um, Are landing page variations created by A/B testing tools um, such as VWO picked up by Google, and do they have an impact on quality score? And secondly, would I be able to measure this via Optimizely? Uh, I, I think what they mean is via optimizer. Well, yeah, and that's a little bit of the name confusion. So it may actually be a question for Optimizely, who does a lot of the A/B testing and landing page testing. Optimizer is about managing the keywords and the bids and the targeting in your account and the ad text as well. Uh, but it is a quality score question, and I was on that team for a long time at Google. So um, Google tends to not measure the, the different landing pages, so they try to look at like what's the standard because they do want to give you the credit for trying to make a different landing page. 
Um, so they don't necessarily want to give you a lower quality score because you are doing some experimentation that hopefully will lead to better results in the future. Um, exactly how the technology works nowadays, uh, I've been out of Google for about five years, so not sure exactly how they do it. But generally, I wouldn't be too concerned about um, testing my landing pages. And then also keep in mind the landing page quality score components of overall quality score is one of the smaller things. And predominantly, Google is still using it to find really horrendous experiences. So they're looking for uh, a website that's a thin landing page, a doorway page that's stealing customer data that's not delivering on promises. Um, so obviously, you know, if you're a good business and you do an A-B test, you're not going to change those types of things from one test to the next. So you should be OK. Um, so yeah. OK. Um. So ne next question, and Jeff, we'll, we'll start with you on this one, but um, you know, with all these new features coming to AdWords and really um, new features um, coming all the time, I mean, I, I think there's it, probably something like roughly 1,000 or so updates every year with, with AdWords, you know, many, many behind the scenes, but a lot kind of on the forefront too. Um, with all these updates, like, how does someone know uh, when it makes sense to to test something or if it's going to be applicable for their account? Sure. So the way that I try to approach it is I try to think about my goals, you know, for, for my account and what's going to help me get to those goals the quickest. And then from there, that's how I decide which functionality that I'll use. So, you know, for example, a client that I manage, primarily they're focused on, on growing their lead volume. So, you know, in that instance, I'll focus like on a lot of, uh, you know, the features that's going to grow traffic or, or, or specifically geared towards growing conversion. So I do try to narrow down that universe a little bit because like you said, you know, at a thousand plus updates a year, you can't test everything. So you have to be you know, hyper focused and 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 use what makes sense for your client and what's going to help them reach their goals. And as a former Googler, um, you know, maybe you guys will have a different take on this, but when we were pushing new experiments on on prospective customers, it was really a way for the product team to try to figure out what is the impact of what we're doing, how do we need to make the UI to make this easy to manage, um, and so. Customers were basically guinea pigs in this whole thing, and you know you might spend six months of effort building something out, and then Google might say, "Well, listen, it's not really driving the results we thought, so we're pulling it right." So all the work is down the drain. So I, I think one of the, the considerations too is if you're an agency, um, is your client paying you enough to do all the manual work that usually comes with all of these experiments? Um, and in many cases, like Hennepin has great big clients, so. Yeah, they can probably afford to do those tests for you, but if you're a little bit more of a, an agency, you know, that works with small businesses, well, listen, are you going to spend six hours um, running an experiment for someone who's paying you 500 bucks a month? Probably doesn't make sense. Um, so that's where you kind of have to, or it's, it's one of the considerations, I think, as well. Yeah, you, you know what I would say? I, I agree with both the... Uh, you know what you're saying. I think it makes sense to try if it you know looks to accompany your goals of the account. You know, for an e-commerce account, for example, I think a lot of the items we we've gone over today really make a lot of sense to test out, um, especially some of these extensions that showcase more of the um, catalog and you know really are, are more visual in nature. And, and same for B2B. I mean. Something like the price extension or promotion may not always apply, but you can still use visual site links. Um, you can still use if functions. Um, all, all of that is is definitely applicable. So, um, you know, try it where it makes sense, and you know, it doesn't have to be you know spending hours upon hours of testing. But you know, as you go forward, try new things, and and also get your clients' input, see what they think, and. Um, how it might work out, and you know, see see if it would be um, you know worth testing. All right. Um, so look, doesn't look like we have any more questions. Um, I do want to ask you guys, kind of for for one one final question, I should say, for the day. Um, 
with these new AdWords features, do you see any of them leading to something bigger? And how I would kind of describe that is, you know, for example, last year we saw the removal of the sidebar ads, which led a couple months later to expanded text ads and having more ads above the organic listings. Do you think any of these updates we've been talking about now um, are really just a stepping stone for, for something else? Yes, I think from a reporting perspective, Google is actually going to make reporting inside of AdWords a lot stronger. Um, and for example, one downside of a data studio is they don't really report on ad text because that's a construct that makes sense in PPC advertising, but data studio is not just about PPC advertising, it's about a lot of other stuff. Um, and so that's one of the benefits you'll see in AdWords when they make their reporting tools a lot more capable. So I think that's going to be a pretty big announcement coming from Google later this year. Yeah, I think that if functions and smart campaigns are building towards something else, uh, it seems that whenever Google wants something, it, it's always in sequence to something else. Uh, I think, you know, on, on the display side, there'll be even more automation, you know, that comes into play. And, uh, you know, it seems that, you know, what also Google's trying to do is, uh, you know, compete, you know, by, you know, whether it's through, you know, people like Fred and, and competing with, with Optimizer, you know, I think through this functionality is they're trying to compete, you know, to try to get a larger share of people to use their products. So while I'm not sure offhand of what it would actually lead to, I do believe that smart, uh, you know, smart campaigns is going to lead maybe to like a, a, a smart uh, search campaign in, in, in like a, a bigger way that's going to use their bidding, you know, in a bigger way. Uh, I, th I think they're, you know, building towards more of an, you know, automated environment where what's going to do is make us as search marketers have to adjust and think more about strategy and, and outcomes. So when we put these automated systems together that we're, we're inputting things in the way that leads to that outcome. Otherwise, uh, you know, we can get lost in all this automation. So I think that it's building along those lines. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what comes out. I'm sure that there's going to be, you know, hundreds of new features, you know, over the course of the year that we'll build on this. Yeah, great points, guys. I, and, I, and I agree there. I think, you know, from my view, I've uh, kind of having more of the, looking at more of the e-commerce background, um, you know, for years, Google Shopping has really been such a big hit. And it even though cost per clicks have increased over the years, it's still, in general, less expensive than, than text ads. And the ads show a lot more information. So I think some of these more visual extensions with the site links, the price extensions, the promos, um, are an attempt to, you know, along with expanded text ads last year, are an attempt to and get more traction for text ads and get more people looking at the text ads um, and not just immediately going to the, the shopping ads. So I guess what I would say is I think we're going to see more of these visual extensions um, continuing to come into the mix. Right. Well, leave that it on questions. A lot of, a lot of good ones today. Um, you know, uh, Fred and uh, Jeff, I know we, um, you know, get, we, we all talked about a lot of uh, good information, so we had some really great questions come out of that. That's great. Um, great. All right. Well, so we're just about at the end. Um, if, of course, thank you for, for attending today. We appreciate all the questions and, and the interaction on Twitter. Um, you can contact <laughs> directly. Um, you can contact uh, Optimizer at support at optimizer.com. And Hannapin, you can connect with at marketing at hannapinmarketing.com. Um, you can also reach out to us on, on Twitter if you want, whether it be Hannapin Marketing or um, PPC Hero. And um, there will be a recording of the webinar uh, shortly, so if you missed anything or want to follow up again, certainly can. <laughs> And so for, for Fred Valleys and Jeff Baum, uh, my name is Matt Umbro. Thank you again for attending our webinar. 
and we'll look forward to seeing you on, on future webinars. Thanks, everyone.